Cindy, that chair is for you. And you're used to this role. We're going to start the regular meeting at this point. Good evening and welcome to tonight's uh, special education, special meeting of the Board of Education uh, concerning superintendent interviews. We will be doing two candidate interviews tonight, two Tuesday, one on Wednesday, and a deliberation to reduce the field to some fi two to three finalists uh, on Wednesday evening after the last interview. Uh, that said, we'll begin the regular meeting at this point, or the meeting agenda at this point, and I'll hand it over to our secretary. Paul Rowe. Uh, President Wasserman. Here. Vice President Baker. Here. Secretary Kaminsky, I'm here. Treasurer Brandstand. Here. Member Gorton. Here. Member McFarland. Here. And Member Van de Kellen. Here. We have everyone in attendance. Great. Uh, at this point, I open it up to the audience for uh, addressing the board. We have no pre scheduled addresses to the board. If anybody here would like to, keep your comments to five minutes, please. And uh, also state what school area you live in. Seeing none, we will move on to the heart of the matter for this evening. First, I'd like to welcome Ms. Cindy Weber, Superintendent Duran, and uh, to interview. And, and uh, Cindy, what I'll do is uh, outline what we're going to do here, and then we'll begin questions as you'll hear. Um, each board member is prepared to ask questions that will seek an understanding of examples of how you've managed things in your past in areas that are of concern to our district. Uh, we feel past behaviors will indicate future behaviors. So the more examples you can give, the better. Um, we will also be allowing follow-up questions, uh, hopefully to either clarify or expand, clarify a point or expand on a point, but not to introduce a whole new, new question. Um, hopefully we'll be, those will be brief because we want to spend most of our time hearing from you, you not you hearing from us at this stage. Um, so I ask the board members to stay on track with their questions and please refrain from speech making. Uh, all candidates will be presented with the same questions as we go through this process, uh, other than the follow-ups, obviously. And uh, I'd like to remind board members that all questions that you do ask must not relate to age, religion, race, national origin, sexual orientation, gender issues, marital status, children, handicaps, criminal record, or financial affairs of the candidate. With that, <laughs> Welcome very, very much to Midland Public Schools. You, you do see the full board in front of you, and we are going to begin with the, um, the first questions as we go forward. We're going to give you 10 minutes or so at the end uh, for you to ask us questions, okay? So I'll begin. Um, let's begin by asking you to briefly describe yourself and your career path, and please give us some concrete examples of your most notable accomplishments uh, that you've achieved in all of your roles, particularly the last several. dissertation because at that time we moved to New York State and um, I started and let me back up my um, PhD work was in curriculum and instruction and administration and when we moved uh, to the Syracuse area I um, enrolled at Syracuse University and I've been working on my doctorate on and off um, since then in educational leadership and uh, again, I'm at the point of uh, finishing up my dissertation. I taught high school for eight years in the thumb in two different districts in Marlette and Vassar. And from there, I got my first administrative job in Midland at the ESA. It was the intermediate school district at that time. 
And um, I was hired to work on a statewide project um, in school placement and, and job training and some of those kinds of areas. And um, as time went on, I became the uh, director of vocational education for the district. And I worked in many curriculum projects and um, initiatives and on grants uh, during my 15 years in Midland. And um, I started the alternative high school, uh, Windover, and uh, worked very closely with that and actually was the principal for a while because of um, budget uh, cuts and things like that. Um, in 1996, I was recruited by Liverpool Central School District um, in Syracuse, New York. It's a district of about the same size as Midland, a um, little bit larger, <coughs> I, I think, um, but about the same size. And um, it had very similar demographics um, as Midland. And I was hired as the assistant superintendent for secondary education. And my responsibilities also included overseeing all the athletics and overseeing technology for the district. Um, I was there for 10 years. And uh, from there, we moved to Long Island. And I was in another large school district um, for two years as the assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction, technology, and human resources. And uh, at that time, we decided to move back home closer to our family. Uh, so I applied for a superintendency in Durand and got it. And so I've been there for the last six years. Um, some of the notable um, projects or um, initiatives that I've worked on. When I was in Liverpool, um, I was chosen by the Bill Gates um, Corporation to go out to Seattle. And I worked with about 50 or 60 other superintendents for a week. Um, they brought uh, a number of people in from Australia, and they were looking at the um, laptop program that Australia had um, developed. And Bill Gates really wanted to bring that initiative to the United States. So we were involved in um, a think tank for the week. And what came out of that is the one-on-one, -on -one, anywhere, anytime learning laptop program that started back in the mid-90s. Um, I went back to my district and um, developed the first one-on-one -on -one laptop program, I believe, in the state of New York. And as you well know, it's very much grown from there. Um, another notable uh, initiative that I've been working on just recently uh, started with an idea that I really wanted to work on teacher evaluation. It's always been something that's really bugged me that we don't do it well in education as a whole. And we weren't really looking at helping teachers to really improve. It was an exercise that took place, put on a shelf, and then next year it happens again and put on a shelf. So out of that initiative, which I'm just still amazed at, we have developed a national model um, in that grew out of Durand. And uh, it's currently one of the four models that's being pilot tested by the state of Michigan to be adopted as um, the teacher evaluation model for, for Michigan. So we're hoping that they adopt all four, or if they adopt one, that it's ours. <laughs> and um, that has been a really exciting initiative. So those are two examples. I can give you others, but those are two examples of some of the more notable things that I've been involved in. Perfect. Thank you. Um, move the question on <coughs> to Lynn. Hi, Cindy. Please describe your leadership and communication style, how you make decisions, resolve conflicts, work with your executive team, administrators, staff, board of education, and move the organization forward. Give us an example of a complex problem you faced and the process you used to resolve it, please. 
That's about 12 questions. It's all rolled up into my phone. Let me see if I can remember back to the beginning. And if you want me to repeat any of that, I, I okay. sure can. Well, if I forget anything, you know, Alrighty. help me out here. Um, I believe that my leadership style is very collaborative. I think you would hear that from all of my administrators. Um, I think a superintendent's role is like a, an, a conductor of an orchestra. <coughs> and as much as I'd like to think that I know everything, I know that I know nothing sometimes. And I think if you surround yourself with good um, people, uh, you really can step back and really be that conductor of making change happen or making um, initiatives happen. And uh, so really I, I feel that I'm very collaborative. I meet very frequently with my administrators. Uh, they know that I have an open door policy that they can come to my office and see me anytime or if I need to go to them, I will. And um, they know that they can call me anytime, day or night, um, with an issue. And uh, we've worked very well together. And that has really been my style throughout my career. Um, I've learned very early on that in order to really move any project forward, you have to bring all the stakeholders together and you really have to collaborate with them to make it happen. Um, when I was working at the um, Intermediate School District, uh, we always felt that we were outsiders looking into each of the, the districts. I mean, we had no authority or really any um, clout to tell districts what to do. So it was through collaboration of, of many, many projects that we were able to bring initiatives to um, all the local districts in Midland County. Okay, you're going to have to help me with more of the questions. <coughs> um, give us an example of a complex problem you faced and the process you used to resolve it. Okay. Um, well, unfortunately, we face many complex problems every day, and especially in today's world. I think one of the most grueling things that um, I've faced over the last six years is to right-size our district and um, really deal with the funding issues and the loss of, of funding and students. Um, our district is very much tied to the auto industry. And in the six years that I've been there, we've lost about 400 students. And we typically do not lose a lot of students to school of choice. Uh, we lost students of families that just left the area because um, their jobs had been eliminated. So that's been a very difficult um, issue to face. And one of the hardest things that I had to do was outsource um, some of our staff and to close two elementary buildings and, of course, lay off a number of people. Um, it, it, it's a very complex issue when you start taking a look at um, how do you deal with all those aspects of, of making that determination to close a building. And it wasn't after a couple years of really looking at every possible cut that we could make before we did that because we wanted to keep our um, cuts as far away from the classroom as possible. Um, and really look at what's best for kids always. Can, can I do a follow up on expand, you know, follow up, so expand on an interesting point. Um, what did you, how did you manage the process of shutting down the buildings? Um, what was the approach used? <clears throat> well, it was a collaborative effort. Um, I've worked every year very closely with our administrators in terms of staffing and um, scheduling and, and looking at, you know, what we really need in our buildings. And uh, it was a collaborative effort on our part to um, really start the design along with the board of, you know, what we could do and how we would do it. And I worked very closely with our, our board again on, on this issue, um, trying to determine what would be the best uh, way to close the buildings. And 
the whole process was over a number of, of months, and we had many, many meetings. We had a number of community forums, a lot of um, news letters that went out to parents in the community. Um, I wrote a lot of uh, editorial type um, letters and just framing the issue for the community because this was a loss that was a deep loss. Our community is not that big and many, many people had to go through a whole grieving process of losing the two schools that we closed. We, we closed the, the two schools that were the furthest away from uh, the city of Durand. And, you know, I had families that had parents and grandparents and great-great-grandparents that had gone to that school and, and uh, were very attached to it. Plus, it was the identity of their small communities because we're, we're three communities in Durand area schools. So um, it, it was a lengthy process and uh, a lot of hand-holding with the staff and, and with our community. And one of the things that I wanted to make sure uh, was that the transition would be as smooth as possible. And not only did we close two buildings, we realigned the whole district so all our grade levels changed. And two of the biggest issues that came out of that was parents really worried about sending their fifth grader to middle school and their eighth grader to the high school. So we had to do a, a lot of um, programming to make sure that the transition was very smooth for the families and for the kids and for our staff. The staff was grieving too because many of them were being displaced into different buildings and they had to come together as a new staff. Um, also, I wanted to make sure that the physical move <coughs> was as easy as possible. So we made sure that in packing, I mean, it was right down to, I'm very detail-oriented, down to the color of the packing um, tape on each of the boxes and labeled to make sure that nothing would get lost. And what left their room would end up in their new room. And that went extremely well because we were very meticulous about taking care there. Um, so those were some of the things that we did. Thank you. Any other follow-ups? Did I answer your whole question? Mm -hmm. You did. Okay. All right. Very well. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Move on to Yvonne. Describe your 90-day plan for entering the district, and please give specific examples of what you would do. Okay. <clears throat> well, first and foremost, I would want to uh, get to know the Board of Education and want to get to know the entire staff. I think in the first 90 days you have to really do a lot of listening and even though I've been in the community um, prior to now and um, was very familiar with Midland Public Schools at the time that I lived here, I would not make any assumptions now that I, I know what is going on in, in the school. So I think it's very important that um, I would do a lot of listening, a lot of um, reaching out to various groups, getting to know people, getting to know the issues of what's happening here and the direction that the district wants to go in before um, I put anything in motion. Thank you. Any follow-ups? We'll move on to question four, John. Describe, <coughs> excuse me, describe the optimal relationship between the board and the superintendent and discuss a time when you needed to advise a board that may have overstepped a policy making boundaries and infringed upon your role as an administrator. Uh, specifically, how did you manage this? Um, I think the optimum relationship is one of absolute trust and good communication. Um, one of my promises that I would always make to you is that I would never surprise you. And I would hope that the board in turn would never surprise me. Um, I tell that to my administrators, um, no surprises. Uh, you know, just give me a heads up of what's happening, um, if it's an issue, if it's something even that they um, messed up on, you know, just tell me, we'll work through it. And I just don't want any 
lots of prizes on the back end. And um, I think really having that two-way communication with the board and working together is an optimum relationship. I have um, had some issues with uh, board members um, acting outside of the boundaries of what they should be doing, and I've had to, you know, call them in and talk to them about this, about the issue, and um, really try to get them to understand, you know, what they did and why it was problematic. So on a one-on-one -on -one basis, um, we've been able to work through some of those issues. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any follow-ups? Kim. Uh, describe the experience, oh, describe your experience with collective bargaining negotiations. What strategies can be used to promote collaborative relationships when bargaining difficult issues? Um, for the last six years, I have been our chief negotiator. Um, this year, I did uh, turn for our teacher contract um, that uh, role over to our attorney. Um, we've been negotiating since last summer, and this has been a very difficult contract because we're asking for givebacks and higher insurance payments. and. Um, I think it's taken our staff uh, a while to really grasp that and understand the whole idea, even though they know it's happening all around them until it happens to you directly. I don't think you have the same appreciation for it. So we've had um, some, I wouldn't say really <coughs> difficult, because uh, I have a really great relationship with our unions. We really haven't had difficult conversations. We just haven't had any movement one way or another. And, and it's been strung out for a long time. Um, I think we're getting very close to um, finally settling our contract. Uh, I just settled two um, other contracts with uh, our support staff. Um, and actually, we did that in one session. Uh, so it's been a very collaborative um, process. I have board members that, that sit on the negotiating team. And uh, we all, you know, collaborate. We, you know, feedback back to the entire board, uh, so that we know that we're all on the same page and where we're going. Um, uh, again, up until this contract, I've I've really had um, the opportunity to sit down with our unions and and work out negotiations fairly easily. Follow-ups. Uh, during that time, did you make any administrative cuts? Yes, we have. Um, we, our administrators are not unionized, um, but we have uh, cut back on our administration. Uh, we eliminated a principal um, when we closed the buildings. Um, my uh, director of finance, uh, we moved to part-time and redistributed some of the, the roles, I took on some of it, and one of my assistants uh, took on additional roles. Um, I'm in the process of eliminating our director of um, maintenance and, and transportation. He just got a job in, an, in another district. And um, we feel that we can redistribute that position and um, maybe hire someone uh, to do part of it at a lower cost. Um, at one time, we eliminated the athletic director. And as a collective whole, we decided it wasn't working very well. We were killing our high school principals um, by serving in that role. So after we reevaluated it, we decided we need to hire a new athletic director. And so this year, we do have um, a full-time athletic director again. I have eliminated our curriculum person um, part-time, and uh, we have moved that back to full-time. Um, that was another decision that we really felt we needed the attention, um, and <coughs> that's one of the key roles that I feel is very important in, in a district. Um, 
we do not have a lot of administrators, so um, we have not had many to cut. We're, we're small enough that everybody wears multiple hats. Another follow-up? Um, anything on pay structures for administrators? Any changes to pay structures for administrators and all of that, or just consolidation of roles? Um, mostly consolidation of roles, and I have a fabulous um, administrative team. They have not had a raise in five years, and many of them have taken on these additional roles with no compensation, and have done it, you know, very well, and I think gladly to help out the district. Thank you. We will move on to Angela. All right. I think you've <coughs> um, already told us a couple of things, so hopefully you can think of another um, <laughs> another one to fit this question. Tell us about one area in your district budget that you have had to trim or modify due to budget constraints, and then how was that decision reached, and who was involved in the decision-making process? Okay. Again, there isn't much that we haven't touched in terms of, of cutting. and. We, we did this as a collective group, and I'm really pleased that in all the cuts that we've made um, year after year after year, we have not cut a program. Um, we have made cuts to uh, a number of our services, and everybody has um, taken on additional roles, and uh, we have eliminated things that I think are necessary in our district, but we, again, tried to keep the cuts away from the classroom, so we've eliminated department heads and um, our NCA chairs and a number of, of things that I really would like to reinstate. Um, we eliminated a, a librarian. We still have one for the district, and that's not nearly enough. Um, all those decisions were made collaboratively with the board and with my administrative group and um, in talking also with the teachers' unions and um, our other support staff. <coughs> Follow-ups? Move on to Scott. <coughs> Mrs. Weber, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, continuing kind of with the financial theme, uh, in light of our economic climate, uh, how do you go about setting fiscal priorities regarding the resources uh, needed for educating children? Um, well, I really, truly believe that the motto that we have followed is what's best for kids. And I think that's the bottom line. You really have to look at uh, what's best for our children in, in the district and how can we provide those services in the most economical way. So when you start there and work backwards, um, it does make the task a little bit easier, not to make the cuts, but to really identify areas that are potential areas to um, eliminate or uh, to change. And I think when you have really um, declining financial issues. I think you have to get a laser focus on what it is that you really want for your children um, curriculum-wise and program-wise. And you can't always be everything to everyone. And so I think you really have to start looking at, you know, what's important. And fortunately, we have not had to eliminate any programs yet. But um, we, we really zeroed in on a, a laser focus of what we were about and <coughs> what we were going to focus on curriculum-wise and try to improve. Okay. Follow-ups? I did have a follow-up question. Is there any way that you employed some of the data and best practices to maybe look at uh, whether you would add anything new to the district or maybe in terms of uh, places like technology and so forth? Oh, absolutely. Um, we uh, last year uh, bought iPads for our entire staff, and we were able to do that uh, through a very small amount of general fund money, um, but also through every imaginable way that you can think of to raise money. 
Um, some of our PTOs and PACs helped us. Um, and I hate to say this, but we even bought a number of them. We raised $5,000 with box tops, um, you know, to get uh, the resources that we needed. And uh, I think we did everything but bake sales. So um, I think we were very creative in being able to do that. And I think it's important that the teachers had them in their hands prior to um, involving our students uh, with a a total push for um, giving our students access. Since then, through some of our title money, um, we have a high percentage of free and reduced, so we, we do get a large amount of title money. Um, we've been able to buy um, a number of iPad carts for our buildings, so each of the buildings have at least one. Um, a couple of the buildings at the um, later grades have multiple carts. And uh, we're still continuing to, to work on, you know, how do we get those pieces into the hands of kids. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. You want follow-ups to the follow-up? Okay, see none. Um, my, I have the next question. I, um, can you give us a, a practical example of what 21st century learning that incorporates technology looks like? What you would like it to look like or what you have actually put in place? Well, I think um, I do agree with part of the initiative of Anytime Anywhere Learning. I think it's important that um, as a district, we are meeting the needs of our students and we all know that our students are coming to us powered up. And it's important that when they hit the doors, we don't ask them to power down. And how that looks in the future, it'll be interesting to see. Um, I think uh, it will include having students bring their own devices in the future. Um, I would really like to see uh, an environment where students are collaborating and working with students from around the world and um, using the technology to help them uh, discover. Uh, there's so much out there now uh, online that and programs online that are free that students can access and districts can access um, to do real-time um, projects with students around the world to um, be able to uh, tap into real-time resources of physicists or um, doctors and, and uh, other avenues that students have that they're interested in. Um, so I really see education changing in the future and I think if we don't, we're going to to be dinosaurs because our students have access 24 hours a day, and we can't <coughs> continue to sit and just lecture them and, and talk to them without really incorporating what their world is all about. And so I think we really have to meet their world, and it's changing very rapidly. I would like to see all the touch screen um, technology that I think is it, it's here, um, it's being used in business and industry, um, and uh, wireless um, virtual keyboards and, and wireless virtual um, computers on desks and anywhere that you are at in a building, you should be able to access some of that. Um, so I think it's really an exciting time. Back in, um, 96 when I moved to New York, uh, one of the things that we did was got our high school at that time, we had a, a large bond project. And um, my charge was to make sure that whatever curriculum we were putting in place, the facilities would then match the curriculum. And we really looked at cutting edge um, technology and cutting edge programs. And one of the things that I um, really insisted on and, and 
it was a struggle, but I really insisted that we had wireless. And at that time, it was really a novel um, thing to have wireless in a building. But uh, we put it in, and it was very successful. It was really neat to see you know, kids even standing outside the building turning in their, their assignments when they were absent from, from school. And that was in the early part of, of when uh, I think technology was really starting to ramp up in schools, when we were doing the laptop programs. And since then, it's just exploded. So I think the sky's the limit. And um, I think uh, I do a lot of reading um, on futuristic type of um, real world applications that I think our, our students are going to be involved in. So very exciting. Any follow-ups? Mm -hmm. yeah. Everyone. Yeah. With, um, with your iPads that you have in your current district, can you give us a concrete example of something that you're using them for technology-wise that you wouldn't have been doing without them? Some way you're using, you know, are you focusing on some type of math curriculum that you're using the iPads for, or, sure. you know, some type of reading program? <coughs> Um, we've been, uh, the last year I challenged a couple of our middle school teachers to um, flip some classrooms and um, that has been very successful so we have others that are starting to flip their classrooms and the iPads have been very helpful in doing that. Um, a lot of the research that um, the students are doing are, you know, they can use the iPads for, um, they have a class set that can come into a classroom. Uh, so those are a, a couple of examples uh, that we're currently doing. And I think, you know, again, we're right on the cusp of, of moving forward rapidly with, with what we can do. John? Yeah, with, the, with the technology enhancements, um, what 21st century learning skills have you aimed to build with the technology with the students? Um, <clears throat> I think collaboration is one of the skills um, that we are really trying to focus on. And teamwork uh, is another 21st century skill that I think is very important. Um, we are doing a lot of group work and small group work. And I think those are some of the kinds of things that students are, are going to see in their career as they enter the work um, force in the future. Any follow-ups? I have one. You started your comments okay. with something very interesting. You said, uh, uh, I think I, I'll catch the right words, you partially agree with anywhere, anytime. Uh, what don't you agree with and why? Um, I really believe in public education and I think the anytime, anywhere learning is a good concept, but I, I really feel that students need um, the brick and mortar schools still. Um, I think totally going virtual is very difficult. Um, you really have to be motivated, and the research has shown that even the students that are motivated, the, um, the rate of Completion is not good. Um, I also think that it's really important <coughs> that students are socialized and learn to work together cooperatively from a very early age on um, to be successful in the future. And if you are just off on your own all the time uh, and not able to do that in a physical sense, I think uh, there's there's going to be a danger in what happens in education. So that's really where I'm coming from in that statement. But I, I love the fact that you know students can learn anytime, anywhere they are, they're at. I'd love to be able to provide internet access to all families. And there are some models out there where districts have done that, that I've looked at. And um, you know, be able to communicate all the time with students and be able to have them do their work you know, when they're home at any time, but I still really believe that we need public education and, and need all the things that make a well-rounded adult. Thank you. Uh, Lynn. 
Cindy, share any experience you may have had in establishing equity for children with differing needs, impl implementing the RTI response to intervention model, and developing and evaluating gifted and talented programs. Um, <clears throat> as I said before, our district has a high percentage of green and reduced. And we have um, a number of students that have a lot of issues. And so we've really had to try to tackle the whole issue of learning and poverty. And that's going to be one of our focuses for next year. Um, we've been looking at the research of Eric Jensen and um, teaching in poverty because it's a totally different aspect of, of teaching and learning that I think we have not addressed very well yet. Um, we do really work with the RTI model. Um, we triangulate our data and zero in on um, you know, what uh, interventions students need individually. And in our district, we have put in what we call STARS teachers who um, work with the students on an individual basis. And then the last couple years, um, I've had additional help with um, some math and ELA and STEM coaches that are working with the teachers and working with students one-on-one -on -one to really uh, try to address the needs of, of students uh, that are struggling. Um, with gifted and talented, uh, my district has a number of AP courses and we do um, have uh, a number of students that are duly enrolled in programs. Um, because of funding, we haven't been able to expand a lot of resources for our students. But one of the things that I did bring to our district, um, I'm involved in a, a group of national superintendents um, that meet twice a year. And um, this organization really has uh, been a tremendous resource for myself. Uh, the superintendents from around the country that are involved in it and um, the resources that they bring to this group um, through corporations and, and other foundations has been tremendous. And <coughs> I was able to work with one of the organizations that um, uh, came to our group. And I now have a, an online blended learning of Chinese Mandarin in our district. And so for a district our size, I think that's kind of unique. And it gives the opportunity for our students to um, really have a different kind of a challenge. And we do have programs where we can um, assist students to move on to um, some college courses also. And I've been working with Baker College. Um, we have a countywide initiative to really t take a look at how we can do um, middle uh, college type of program in the future for our students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more follow-ups? Yep. <coughs> with, uh, with the resources in the, the community as far as after school programs and partnering with other community based organizations, have you used or implemented some of the resources in the community to assist maybe with some of the, the challenged uh, underserved uh, kids? Um, Absolutely. Uh, I've had some cooperative programs that I've put together with uh, Shiawassee um, United Way through the YMCA. And uh, we did an elementary program last year and a program with our alternative ed program. Um, I have a cooperative agreement with the city of Duran <coughs> with my alternative program. Um, <coughs> we, we thought it was a, a neat cost saving um, partnership and uh, I did not like where our students were located. It was not in the best place. And I thought the facility was run down. And I, I really believe that even if a student is in an alternative setting, they deserve the best. And so we moved our um, alternative program to the building next door to our administration center. It also houses the ambulance center. And uh, the city of Duran gives us that access free, utilities free, everything is free, and we provide technology services to the city. So my staff goes out and you know works with the city. Now that's not a direct program type of 
uh, partnership, but it's really been one that's been beneficial for our students to have um, a nice facility to uh, be in. Um, also, I reached out to our Rotary Club, I'm a <coughs> Rotarian, and a uh, year before last, we had a program with the Red Cross to provide a backpack um, program to our students. There was about 35 that participated uh, to provide a meal, a snack type of meal over the weekend uh, when they were going home. And uh, last year, the Red Cross was not able to continue the program. So I went to our Rotarian group and said, this is a project that I'd really like some help with. So the upshot of it is they raised uh, quite a bit of money. We started going around to other community organizations like Lions and Vets and, and uh, the Eagles, and we raised about $10,000. And we started the backpack program, and we had 125 students participate last year. And uh, it was one of the first times people told me that uh, in the city of Duran that every organization really came together for a common project to work on which was very exciting. And this year, uh, I think we've raised about $8,000. And so the program has continued. And there's been a real commitment to move forward with that program. Over the last six years since I've been there, I've seen our free and reduced numbers uh, go from 30, about 34.9% to over 64% um, at its highest. So those are a few examples. Um, Oh, we partner with with the um, ISD on a number of, of programs to bring services uh, to our students through the local districts. And um, that has been very helpful, too. Thank you. Good. Any other follow-ups? Have you been able to um, provide free and reduced supper for any of the kids in the building, Title I buildings? No, we have not. We just have done the backpack program. And one of the things, the questions that, a question that kept coming up from uh, groups as I would uh, speak with them about the program is, well, what happens when school is out at the end of the school year? And my answer has been, well, we can only do what we can do. And that really bothered me. I didn't like that answer because kids are going to still be hungry over the summer. So we wrote a grant, and this summer, June 6th, we are starting throughout the summer till the end of July a uh, lunch program for any student that's 18 or under, even if they're not free and reduced. Uh, we got the funding to provide that program, so I'm very happy that we were able to do that. Where'd you find the funding? It was a grant. From? Um, it's through the Department of um, Social Services. And it's, um, oh, let me think of the title of it. It's um, uh, something up and speed up. I can't, I can't remember the title of it, but it was a grant that was available. And actually, our school nurse was um, very helpful in writing it. And uh, she has just been a really wonderful resource. She's not employed by our district. She's employed by uh, the Department of uh, Labor, and uh, she is a real go-getter, and she really helped us get that grant. Great. Any others? I think we were <coughs> to Yvonne, right? Mm -hmm. Describe your knowledge and any specific experience you may have had in implementing and evaluating international baccalaureate programs. <clears throat> um, that's one area that um, I have not had any experience with. Um, I'm very much a proponent of International Baccalaureate. I think it's a wonderful program. I've always wanted to be in a district that has that program. Um, I know you've started the program here, and I'd really like to be a part of helping that program expand, K-12. I think it's a, a very worthwhile program. and. Um, for 21st century learning, I mean, it has all the components that I think students need for the future. So I have not evaluated a program or really run one. Thank you. Any follow-ups? 
Well, I had been wondering, because you have two dissertations that <laughs> you are going to finish, and I was wondering if you would be interested in doing that on the International Baccalaureate and how it works with project-based learning. Um, well, I've not had that question posed to me before. I would be open to it. Um, I, my second dissertation that I haven't finished, I've decided that um, I really think the research that I did is outdated at this point, and I've been speaking with my professor about really looking into a, a different avenue, and I would be open to ideas and suggestions. That would be great. So you did finish your first dissertation? No, I didn't finish that one oh, okay. either. <laughs> Life, you know, happens. Oh, yeah. We moved a number of times and, and um, family and that type of thing. It, it uh, just kept getting shoved to the back. But I have more credits than mm, Yes, I, I saw. Very impressive. <laughs> okay. So move to John. What experience have you had in helping the school district develop or modify program priorities? Um, well, I've actually had a lot of experience um, helping the districts that I've been in um, really take a look at programming and direction that, that they need to go. I'll give you a couple examples from my last position since I talked about Durand a lot. Um, when I was in Liverpool, uh, as I stated before, we were gutting the high school and my charge was to make sure that whatever um, curriculum that we were going to put in place, because we gutted a number of programs, that the facilities matched what we were doing. And one of the program changes that I felt we really needed to make was our industrial arts wing. It was a traditional industrial arts with the auto and and um, carpentry and all those things. Um, I think we had 10 teachers at the time, and I really felt that the programs would be dinosaurs if we didn't make some significant changes. And um, retrofitting those, those facilities for um, those types of, of programs was very expensive. And we had skill centers that had duplicate programs that I felt you know, we really needed to to join um, and collaborate with more. So in um, meeting with the staff, and I, I sat them down and, and really walked them through a lot of um, research and, and talked to them a lot about, brought in people about directions that we should go. And what we ended up doing was creating academies, and we had a graphic art Academy. We had a CAD Academy um, for um, uh, drawing, and we had uh, an Academy for um, uh, broadcasting and um, printing and that type of thing. And we had a, a modeling Academy. Um, we had a number of pieces of equipment donated to us by Carrier for 3D modeling. Um, as part of the, the CAD program. So we were able to really transform those programs into some high-tech, cutting-edge programs that were and still are um, the envy of many districts in New York State. Liverpool was one of the top five districts in the state of New York, and um, uh, you know many, many people came to see our programming that we did. I also um, looked at our business classes and felt that we needed to do some updating there. So we eliminated a, a number of our business classes. I worked with the staff, and we um, went down the route of Cisco networking, A++ training, um, C++, or A++, and C++ training, um, Microsoft programming at that time. So we really did some cutting edge and, and high tech um, programming in, in that area. And we went out and we looked at a number of schools around the country. We went out to California and looked at some schools and what they were doing out there to really determine you know, what would be the best um, program for us. So those were a couple of <coughs> things that 
I really had an opportunity to influence and, and work with staff on changing and, and making some cuts. Um, do you want another example? Sure. Oh, have another one. one. Sure. <laughs> do you have one for your time in Durand? Um, let's see. Well, I think what we are doing um, in terms of teacher evaluation is very cutting edge. and. Um, I've worked very closely with a leadership team of teachers and the union uh, to really take a look at um, what we were doing and how we could uh, really create a model that uh, promoted excellence and growth um, among our teachers and not be punitive. Um, and an offshoot of that, uh, we decided that we also wanted to take a look at local data in terms of uh, determining student growth. And so we developed uh, two things that um, I, I think are pretty exciting. One is a VKR, a, vocab a vocabulary knowledge rating. And we had our teachers get together and by grade levels and then by um, subject areas, um, identify the most important vocabulary and concepts that students need when they leave that grade or leave that specific course. And once we got the lists together and pared them down and, and went through a, a lot of um, iterations of what we were doing, um, we did pre and post tests on the students to um, determine the student growth. And we did a gap analysis to also look at what the potential gap was. And we pilot tested that the first year and implemented it last year, and it's in full swing this year. And the other thing that we started um, taking a look at was uh, key thinking and, and literacy skills. And our students' ability to read and comprehend you know, rigorous text and make critical comparisons. And we worked with uh, Dr. Harvey Silver, who has been working with my district now for s about five years, um, to develop testlets to really um, mirror the Common Core types of, of questions that will be on the Common Core exams. And um, again, pre and post students, uh, pre and post test students on um, these concepts. And that's been very exciting. This is our first year of implementation. Excellent. Now, the, the students that you uh, were teaching the Cisco Networking A++, were they able to uh, have jobs right after high school? Yes, many of them. We worked with a lot of businesses uh, in the area to, you know, articulate and line up our students for mm -hmm. post. Wonderful. Secondary. We had a lot of partnerships, like I said, with Carrier and uh, a number of, of large industry in, in the Syracuse area. Uh, let's see. Moving on to Kim. Uh, discuss your knowledge and any specific experiences in helping a district measure and report its own progress towards a str strategic vision. Um. <clears throat> Well, I think through our school improvement plan, um, we've been able to really identify um, the needs that our district has and identify goals and put those goals in place and then um, really identify the resources that we needed. And we use multiple measures uh, to see what progress that we're making towards those goals, um, achievement um, data, and as I said, we triangulate our data. Um, we uh, really work with the RTI model. And we like to um, make sure that uh, we're making progress in those areas. So we, we do a lot of um, data analysis. And we give that back to not only the principals, but um, the teachers as well so we can have checks and balances of how we're doing and individually how we're doing with students and then how well we're progressing with the goals that we've set for the programs. Have you ever been involved in creating a dashboard for like the Board of Education or the community so they can see class sizes and building capacity? 
Um, we don't have um, that kind of a dashboard out there, but we have really used all that data and worked with our community and, and in a number of presentations and things that we've made, we've shared that kind of um, data with our, our, not only our board, they have that data all the time, but our community. And so they, they know and understand where we're at with our goals. And um, we've tried to keep the class sizes at a reasonable level. Any others? Move on to Angela. All right. Um, tell us about one initiative you are most proud of that you have implemented in your district, and what was the largest potential barrier to implementation, and how did you overcome that issue? Um, well, I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is the work that we've been doing in teacher evaluation. Um, it's been a very <coughs> collaborative effort with our staff, and it has, uh, the work that we've been doing along with the work in, in thoughtful education has really started to transform um, our, our staff in terms of, of instruction and teacher effectiveness, and um, <coughs> it's, it's really been exciting to see that happen, and as you all know, change does not happen very easily, and it takes time, and fortunately, our board <coughs> has uh, supported that and um, realizes that it does take time to make those changes and have uh, scores improve. We've had our ups and downs with scores. Um, it, last year, our scores took a real nosedive, but that was the uh, first year after we had closed buildings. We had a total realignment of <coughs> grade levels, eighth graders going to the high school, and the teachers had never taught eighth graders for the most part. Um, fifth graders <coughs> moving to you know the middle school. Um, so there was a lot of of transition going there, and uh, our, our scores took a real dip, but they've started to come back up again. And then, of course, everybody's took a dip when um, they changed the, the uh, um, rubric for the scoring. So um, help me out again. What part am I not answering? Just, just an, it, it was what was one of the initiatives, and then what were the barriers okay. to that, and how did you overcome the barriers? Okay. Um, I think, you know, some of the barriers in helping teachers think differently and, and change their practice um, have been the resistance from some staff of, you know, I've done it this way forever, and it's been fine. You know, why do I need to change? And... Uh, so I think, you know, really working with them over a period of time and having the, the principals work with them over a period of time, some of them still aren't there yet. I mean, you know, they're dragging their feet, but they're starting to really come along. And I think they're really recognizing that um, school has changed and our kids have changed. I mean, over the last 10 years, there's been such a dramatic change in, in the way we need to teach and the way kids learn and technology has been a big part of that. So there's, there's been setbacks and, and stumbling blocks of, of um, you know, people not working on the curriculum that we've been asking them to work on in the way we've been asking them to do it. And, and um, so you really have to go back and, and rethink and retread and try it again. And, it's hard work. Any follow-up? <coughs> Scott? No. Oh. It's <laughs> yes, to you. No follow-up. <laughs> Next question. I have a two-part question for okay. you. Oh, no, another two-part. It's okay. <laughs> can you tell us why you think you'd be a good fit as a superintendent in Midland Public Schools? And you can answer these in any order. And what do you think are the most significant issues facing MPS, and how would you begin to address them? Um, I really believe I would be a good fit for Midland Public Schools uh, because I, I do know and understand the community. 
Uh, I lived here for 15 years, and I've worked very closely with, with Marine um, schools. So I know somewhat of how it, it used to operate, and I, I think in many ways um, the culture is still very much the same from the research that I've been doing. Um, and I still know a lot of people in the area. And I think that gives me an opportunity to have, um, you know, a little bit of a, a head start in moving to a new, you know, back to a new area and working with a new school district um, to know where some of those resources are and be able to tap into them already. Um, I would not um, presume to tell you what direction I think Midland Public Schools needs to go in and, and what your issues are. Um, but I know everyone is, is facing several challenges. Um, one of the challenges is financial. And all of us are, are dealing with that uh, to the best of our ability. So I think that's a, a challenge that's going to continue at least for the next couple years. Um, I also think the um, challenge of really moving the district forward with technology is is another challenge. Uh, and to what degree and at what level, I couldn't answer that at this point. And hopefully tomorrow your, um, your bond proposals will pass. And I would love the opportunity to um, work with the district on renovating and, and implementing new programs and implementing technology in the, in the district. I've had quite a bit of experience uh, with that. As I mentioned several times in Liverpool, we uh, did a huge renovation, a $35 million renovation of our high school. I was involved in a middle school elementary um, renovation plus new construction. And then when I came to uh, Durand, they had just passed the year before a um, uh, bond proposal to renovate all the buildings in the, the district. And uh, so I had the opportunity of working with that for three years. So I have a lot of experience in, in those areas, and I think I could uh, bring my talents and experience to Midland Public Schools to enhance what you're already um, doing and, and, and looking to do. Uh, like I said in the very beginning, um, I really want to be in a, a district that's progressive, that values education, and values excellence. And I think I have a lot of um, great ideas. I have a lot of resources to call upon. Um, I'm a member of a couple national superintendent groups. I was just um, invited to join the, the national um, superintendent's roundtable. And it's very similar to uh, the NSERT group that I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago with uh, superintendents that collectively um, share resources and, and um, ideas. And um, I'm on a, no a number of, uh, and have been on a number of national committees. Um, I serve now on a, a STEM project at, uh, for the um, National Science Foundation. And uh, I think all those experiences uh, would really bode me well in, in terms of working with Midland Public Schools and, and being your next superintendent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any follow-ups? <clears throat> we do have a little bit more time. We, we have a round three of questions. We'll go as far as we can because we want to okay. give you the, the 10 minutes to, okay. to ask us questions. Um, some of these you've kind of answered already, so I'm going to pass on my next question. It was about technology implementation. You've, you've touched that a lot with your New York experience. Um, I'll pass it on to Lynn then. Alrighty. Describe your vision for an exemplary and comprehensive model of special education services. Give specific examples of how you have implemented that vision in your current position. And the third part, give examples of how you would support full inclusion special education programs. Um, my district is a full inclusion district. Um, we tend to have a number of students come to our district because of our special ed program. 
Uh, we have uh, implemented a couple years ago um, co-teaching, a co-teaching model uh, at our elementary and our middle level and high school. Uh, so we are able to have full inclusion and um, we do a number of also pullouts with our students and of course they're on you know individualized plans uh, to really position them to be as successful as they can be. Thank you. Any follow-ups? I do have, I do have a follow-up question. Do you have any experience in using RTI response uh, to intervention to reduce the number of children that may need special education services? Absolutely. That's been one of our goals. And in Durand, we've been working at that, uh, really at the lower elementary level, uh, to really um, beef up what the students need and really zero in on the um, the skills that the students are, are lacking in. And as I said, we implemented STARS teachers and coaches to really work directly with those students. Super. Thank you. Okay. Any others to follow up on that? We'll move to Yvonne. Do you have experience with referenda? What are the most important aspects of undertaking a referendum? Um, I, I do. Um, Unfortunately, in Duran, we've uh, tried to pass our sinking fund and, and Headley Amendment a couple times, and we have not been able to do so. And I think partly it's been timing. Because uh, right on the heels of uh, our bond proposal is when the economy started to go south, and that's been a, a large factor in uh, trying to pass uh, those two initiatives. We are um, putting on the ballot again in the fall um, the Headley Amendment and I have um, a, a parent board committee group that has branched off and they are really taking the lead on um, getting organized and um, I identifying the things that they need to do uh, to get the yes voters out. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, data analysis on you know where the no votes have come from and um, you know drawn some conclusions from those um, one initiative that uh, was very successful when I worked at um, Midland ISD um, Jim McKimmy was the superintendent at the time and he he just came on board and uh, he charged me with um, heading up the uh, charter millage for special ed because Midland was the only um, ISD in the county without one and uh, I led that charge and it was quite a process and at the time I really didn't know that much about special ed I learned a lot and um, I guess he gave me that charge because my background was marketing and um, advertising that type of thing so uh, we um, we formed committees and you know we we had quite a campaign and if you remember it it did pass and it passed I think in every county um, not county every precinct uh, within the county and uh, we were very proud of that and uh, our logo or our um, slogan was everyone wins and um, fortunately that that happened so okay. I've had some experience I'll Thank you. defer from the next question uh, so that we can go into your questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, before <coughs> more questions, is there anything else you want us to know about you that we didn't touch? Um, I can't really think of anything. I mean, you touched on a lot of uh, multi-layered questions that I hope I've answered all of, all of your, your issues. Um, so I think, you know. Okay. Then, 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 we'll, then we'll turn it over to you. Uh, and as you ask questions, I'll ask for individual board members who care to answer it to, to answer it and others to pile on if they care to. And we'll go from there. So feel free. First of all, I'd like to ask, what are you most proud of in Midland? Anyone want to take it? I will. 
I, I would believe, Cindy, we're most proud of um, our staff and our, and our, and our um, schools and parents and community working together. Our, our staff really has steps up to the plate and does um, great services for our children and our, and our families. Anybody else? I would say one of the things I love is just the breadth of options that kids have from not only curricular but extracurricular. It's just, I, I feel like there's a spot for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're a high achieving district, so we're very proud of that. I would, I would uh, voice uh, some of like five things, but the main one that is interesting about the Midland community, and I think um, as we did our polling of the community for what they wanted in a new superintendent mm -hmm. is outsiders look in and find out real quick how interwoven the community is. Right. And uh, that interwovenness facilitates resources, <laughs> it facilitates staff, it facilitates a lot of things and enables these things these folks just pointed out. And uh, I, I'm most proud of Midland and how it all comes together mm -hmm. uh, from community centers to social services to schools to foundations to companies. Uh, all weaves together a fabric that makes it a wonderful place for kids. And schools are obviously a very, very important and vital part of that, but it isn't that we do it on our own. It's, it's a whole community involvement. Right. Yeah, I've always marveled at that. I've, I've told people um, when I've lived in other areas that I came from an area that was really kind of a utopia. I mean, it was, I, I said, it's hard to explain what Midland is, is like because it's like no other community that I've ever lived in. And, uh, the way people come together and the programs that come together, it's very exciting. Love to come back and be a part of that. Yeah. Do you have and the things that came to mind is the, um, the achievement and the uh, success of our students, but also uh, being a service club member here in the community as Midland takes care of its own. Mm -hmm. And there's been so much support from the community to make sure that all kids, regardless of uh, financial background, you know, socioeconomic status, have of those opportunities everything from the sports to school programs mm -hmm. and so forth and that's really a, a very much a hallmark of our community Outstanding. Yes. other question what do you think is your biggest challenges that are facing you in the future I can take that okay. the uh, the ability to innovate okay. innovate and be able to make the best, uh, use the best practices, the best data to go forward with the resources we have um, with the constraints, but it, be able to innovate and continue the excellent, uh, excellence with how education is going to look different in the future. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pressure to change and to keep that standard up sure. and to work smartly. Well, and I like your history of collaboration because that is definitely what's needed to keep the innovation at the level that we don't need it. So it was very. Now, in Syracuse, you did a lot of collaboration. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That there is a group that is uh, in Midland that is a think tank for Midland mm -hmm. Public Schools, and you'll just have a wealth of resources that you could use. So, um, one of the things. Uh, when I was in Liverpool, one of my first challenges also was to take three junior highs and transform them into middle schools. And um, I, I looked at the principals, practically the first meeting I had with them, I said, we can do this in a year. And they had been trying to do this for a couple years and hadn't been able to achieve it. And I know their eyes got really big and then they said, okay, let's, let's go. And so we identified key people in, in the community and in the buildings and key parents. And we had a, a committee of about 25 that met religiously for a year every week. And I just gave them research, all kinds of research and um, ideas of how we could do this and what we might want, want it to look like. And we brought in you know, some experts to help us. And in the end, this group was so galvanized. I mean, it was there. It wasn't mine. I, I didn't make it happen. They made it happen, and they stood up against uh, a, a huge crowd of, of parents. Um, there was about a thousand in the auditorium to answer questions of why what we were planning and suggesting was the right thing to do. 
and um, again, it wasn't me, it was that group. Um, I was just the facilitator. Any others who address that? Um, any other challenges that you see uh, in terms of finance? Well, I'll take that one right away. Okay. <laughs> um, I think you said it best, and I think I wrote it down as a quote. They are still there. They will still be there. They will need to be addressed. And how do we achieve everything we want to achieve in light of those and, and get through that mm -hmm. uh, will be a challenge. And uh, to say otherwise would be, you know, misleading. Mm -hmm. um, so the question becomes not so much how to get the finances in order; it's how to keep the finance, get the finances in order, yet achieve all our other uh, objectives. Uh, if we're lucky, uh, lucky. If we're blessed by our electorate tomorrow, we'll have a technology millage to, to needs to be implemented. And uh, we'll have a sinking fund that will be able to facilitate our buildings for the next decade. Mm -hmm. But it will not relieve our operating issues that tremendously, and we'll have to deal with those yet. Sure. And still achieve all those other objectives of high achievement, technology implementation, and creativity and innovation that we just talked about. And of course, one of the biggest challenges is what everyone faces is coming from the state. It's, it's kind of like a moving target that we're trying to... Uh you know, figure out. So it's Absolutely. like, you know, here's the governor's budget, here's the house, here's the Senate, which one's it gonna be? And based on that, you know, where do we set our budget? Right. Um, I typically am very conservative as I budget. Um, so I usually take the worst case scenario and then work backwards from there. And that has served our dif district mm -hmm. well. Um, we've been in the plaque, one of the few that are in our county that have been. That's quickly dwindling. We're in a, a more difficult place now, but um, yeah, it is definitely a moving target. I spend a, a fair amount of time in Lansing. Yeah. What's interesting is a challenge that with uh, Midland Public Schools is the loss of the 20J money, mm. us being a 20J district. So sure. it's going over two million a year. I think we've adjusted to the new normal, mm -hmm. but uh, you know that's uh, still um, has. Uh, our uh, district scrambling for um, a greater deficit or change over time. And it's unlikely that, uh, especially with some of the, uh, it depends how you read the tea leaves uh, with Lansing, it doesn't look like that's going to be coming back or changing. So. Any others? I don't have any additional questions. Okay. So thank you. Um, for good order's sake, any last questions we'd care to have of Cindy? Seeing none, we'll uh, conclude this interview. Uh, Wednesday night, we'll be making our deliberation uh, of the next round of interviews, and I, I think you know the next dates if you are so selected. And we appreciate you coming up from Durand. I, I bicycle through Durand oh, a do? couple times a year. And so I'm very familiar with your community. I love your, your uh, train station. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> all parts of our uh, community. Yeah, all our that community. Is the trench. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. Has so. the water gone down? I was up here the other day. And yeah, it's gone way much farther down. Yeah, I, I lived here when we had the 100 year flood. Yeah, the 86. We almost had another one. It came close. Um, I have a, a copy that I made for you of one of the articles that I just recently had published. That'd be great. Um, that I thought Fabulous. I would share with you. Very much. Thank so. you. So we'll be contacting you Wednesday night, probably more Thursday, is what you can be assuming. Okay. So thank you for coming. And we'll not adjourn. We will take a break for five minutes. Right. And then uh, we'll bring the next candidate in uh, right after we take our break.
teilen uns. I'd introduce everybody to Dr. Jeff Hall, uh, who probably pretty familiar to a lot of people in the room and uh, on the TV. Um, Jeff, let me outline what's going to happen here as we go forward. Um, each board member is prepared to ask you questions. Um, they'll seek your understanding mostly of examples of, of what you've achieved in, in this particular area they may be talking about. Okay. Uh, so best you can give examples is best. Um, same questions will be asked to all the candidates. Board members will be offered the opportunity for follow-up questions, either to clarify or dig a little deeper into the first question, its responses. Uh, those may di be different from candidate to candidate, obviously. Um, hopefully, we won't make a lot of speeches. It'll be some of the questions are kind of long, so feel free to ask again about what was said. <laughs> and um, we, um, what am I trying to get to? We will be getting back to you probably next Thursday on the status of the interview. This Thursday, I'm sorry, this Thursday, uh, as we go forward. So the board members will um, refrain from asking questions about race, religion, et cetera. I won't go through the whole list again as we did the first person because the board now knows. And um, we'll, at, we'll save 10 minutes at the end for you to ask us questions. And the board members will be taking notes throughout, so don't be offended if those heads are down and scribbling. They're listening okay. vigorously. Okay, that said, uh, first of all, welcome. And uh, let's begin by asking you to briefly tell us about yourself and your career path. Uh, give some concrete examples of your biggest accomplishments you'd like to highlight without a whole lot of depth, because we'll go into them sure. a little bit later after that. I want to thank the board for the opportunity to interview. Uh, I appreciate coming in tonight and having a chance to uh, interview before the board. Um, as you're aware, I had the opportunity to work within the district for 14 years as an administrator. Uh, those were 14 fantastic years. I spent nine of those years as a district-wide administrator. I began my career as a supervisor of special education. I did that for eight years, and then for three years, I was the principal of East Lawn Elementary School, and then for two years after that, I was the principal of Central Middle School, and followed by a year as the director of school administration. Uh, my education, I began uh, at the University of Michigan and received a bachelor's degree, then went on to uh, University of Detroit, received a master's and a specialist, and then I had another master's degree from Grand Valley State University. Participated in the fellowship program through SVSU, uh, which afforded me the opportunity to do some international study, and then uh, completed my doctorate through Central Michigan University in 2003, defended in July of 2011. And I just want to go back to my uh, career with uh, Middle Public Schools, and I learned a tremendous amount during that time. It was a fantastic experience. Uh, learned what a high achieving, high expectations district this is, and it was a wonderful 14 years. Uh, the, just the talented teachers and talented administrators and supportive community was a fantastic experience. Thank you. I'll turn the first next question over to Lynn. Already. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Please describe your leadership and communication style. This is long, but you feel free to stop me if you need to, a, a repeat. How you make decisions, resolve conflicts, work with your executive team, administrators, staff, board of education, and move the organization forward. Give us an example of a complex problem you faced and the process you used to resolve it. All right. I think uh, my leadership style is going to be very participatory. Uh, involving the stakeholders. I think when we're looking at uh, items that need to be addressed or initiative, having the key players involved, uh, making sure to listen first, making sure I'm understanding perspective, uh, developing action plan based on learning the information. Uh, the communication style, uh, communication methods, I think you need to be involved with a variety of communi communication methods, both formal and informal. Relationship building, I think, is crucial to success uh, within any leadership position, but especially in a position like this. Relationship building is crucial. Um, within uh, the, the position I'm currently in, 
we put in a variety of both informal and formal measures. We have uh, obviously traditional measures where we're writing um, uh, different blogs and we're writing different uh, newsletters that go out. But in addition, we have uh, implemented a Facebook page. We've also recently put together a Twitter account, uh, making sure that we're communicating. I think if you want to reach people under 25, Twitter is a way to reach people under 25. Uh, one of the ways that we've done that, and we've been gathering information, we want to make sure that we're getting positive message out repeatedly. So we gather the morning announcements from all the buildings, and we tweet out key pieces of information throughout the day. Some of the positive things are taking place. We have very positive message that's going forward. Uh, the, in regards to resolving conflict, I think may, trying to understand first, getting to what's underneath the conflict, trying to understand the dynamics that take place uh, within the conflict, what's driving that conflict, what are the key uh, factors underneath that, and trying to be able to reach a solution where both sides feel like they've had input and resolve the issue uh, accordingly. You mentioned a piece with staff. Uh, if you can give me the, the, the last half of that regarding staff, and you said some examples regarding accomplishments, is that correct? Yes, give us an example of a complex problem you faced in the process you used to resolve it. Okay. One of the things that, uh, you know, with my recent position, we were facing a variety of challenging factors. I'm in Swartz Creek Community Schools, and we have a budget of about $34 million. And when I came to the district, we had $3.7 million in fund equity, but we had $2.7 million structural deficit. So within 24 months, we were going to be a deficit district. And we did not have a real sense of urgency within our district to address some of those key points. So the, we had that issue taking place within our budget. At the same time, we were seeing our, our test scores were declining. So and they were significantly lower what you'd anticipate based on some of our demographic data, our scores were showing a, a significant decline. So I faced an environment where we had a budget that was needed to be addressed immediately. We had student achievement that was declining. So those factors are going in. So I was trying to break the problem apart into various pieces. One, creating the message. What are we all about? If you go back to your mission statement and vision statement, we're about teaching and learning. That's what we're here for. That's what we're all about. That's where our efforts go. So every opportunity I had to do that, creating that message, creating that, creating systems that address those issues. We had um, our curriculum division, and within some of our secondary level, there really wasn't a lot of structure for analyzing the curriculum or working with data or knowing how your students were doing. So we quickly put in uh, pieces to, into it so that we were addressing the curricular issues right away, reviewing our curriculum. Our math scores had, had also declined significantly, so we immediately put that as far as the curriculum committee looking at uh, areas within our math curriculum, piloting different math curriculum areas, getting feedback from our teachers and from our um, stakeholders, and then adopting curriculum and putting the PD in place. At the same time, we had to address the budget issues. So we didn't have a wealth of uh, resources in order to address that. So we knew that was something that had to be done immediately. So we worked in creating, you know, the first step with creating a change was, one, there is a problem. And we do have issues that need to be addressed. So creating the, the sense of urgency within our budget um, with our budget presentation. We also implemented, we talked about communication piece. One of the things I put in play, place is uh, within, our, within 48 hours after our board meeting, we have what's called a boardogram that goes out. It's basically a Reader's Digest version of what took place. And this is emailed out to all staff members. And they have attachments of any PowerPoints or any presentations uh, so that they can see what's taking place. So this gives me a forum when we were addressing some of the issues regarding the, creating a sense of urgency uh, within our budget that was able to come into place. Also with all the curricular issues that need to be addressed, we were able to reach them directly with the email uh, presentations and the uh, corresponding period. So that's, in the, that's something that's been in the process of addressing. Obviously it's ongoing. This is my second year within the district and we're continuing to address that, but that's a very complex issue given our budget and also given where we're at with the status of achievement within the <coughs> district I'm in. Anybody have a follow-up? Jeff, was your board aware of how close they were to the cliff? Not to cliff? that degree, no. I think, uh, you know, there was always, this, when I first started bringing it up, you know, I, I got on board in July, I started digging through all of the information, and I don't, there wasn't the sense of urgency. And obviously, if you want to facilitate change, you need to talk about what's the reasons why. Why do things need to be different than they are right now? And certainly, if you're looking at a $2.4 million structural deficit, only $3.7 million in fund equity, things have to change in a hurry and you need to build the case for why they need to change uh, significantly. So we, we really didn't have that sense of urgency with the board, and that's where I started. And we came in and we had the audit shortly thereafter. We started going through the audit, looking at all the pieces that were within that. Obviously, 88% of our budget uh, is around personnel, uh, so you only have 11% obviously that's discretionary, and much of that is not discretionary when you're talking about fuel and uh, other purchases that come into play. So we started looking at what are ways that we can 
um, be creative and problem solve and what are ways, and so we started putting price tag with various options. Many of the things that I've learned through the years that I had been here was something I had to put in place immediately and at the same time address the curriculum issues because first and foremost we have a duty to our students into that mission statement. Uh, making sure, and we have seen our test scores up, our ACT scores in the spring of um, 2012 were up in every subject and then uh, this year our MEEP scores are up in math in every grade and those were two initiatives, initiatives we were able to put in place in 11-12. Uh, Thank you. Any follow-up for us? We'll go to Yvonne. Describe your 90-day plan for entering the district. Please give specific examples of what you would do. I have a handout. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. Let's talk a little bit about that. That's a great question. I think it's important that uh, with superintendents that they enter the district and have a plan in place for how to be successful and what needs to be done. So let me walk through as far as my, I put it as a 100-day plan, I can shot 10 days off. <laughs> the uh, first and foremost, the first goal I would have is obviously listen and learn. And that's just where you're reestablishing and uh, deep develop, uh, develop deep collaboration relationships with the MPS stakeholders. This is the piece where you need to reestablish a relationship. I talked about relationship being the key to any successful uh, superintendent or administrator. And that can be done through hosting administra or hosting superintendent roundtable meetings, listing and establish relationship with key stakeholders within the community, establishing meeting schedule with the Board of Education, listing, taking in the information, meeting with school personnel to build and support communication, and then I think scheduling a board retreat within the first 60 days to talk about goals based on that information. Second part of the action plan would be a systems review and an organizational capacity. And the purpose of this goal is to define and prioritize key concepts, critical issues, organizational capacity, and opportunities for greater efficiency. And this can be done with a SWOT analysis where you're looking at your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and analyze to conduct a deep evaluation of each program and service, and review and establish goal for each program and service, and review the current strategic plan and accountability structure, and then provide, present findings and priorities within the first uh, 100 days. Third goal would be focusing in on student achievement. And this is where you define and prioritize opportunities for improving student achievement. And from my end, that would be done by, again, setting the tone for the district with communication of strong expectations, high expectations, shared purpose of student achievement, building a shared vision and commitment, and a comprehensive review of student achievement data, tools, and process with leadership teams. And then reviewing each of the school improvement plans and the district school improvement plans, and then look at the professional development efforts that have been taking place to meet the, those goals. And then finally, creating an action plan based on our prioritizing on continuous improvement within the first 100 days. And the fourth goal will be to focus on organization and finance. And this is to increase the organization's efficiency and effectiveness. And again, reviewing the financial material, the budget, and the critical issues for programs and services. Reaffirm goals, establish financial projections, variables, and resources allocations to the district's mission and budget process. And assess collaborative opportunities for service with educational partners. And present findings and priority, priorities within the 100, first 100 days via strategic program. Did you use this when you got to Schwartz Creek, I or did. did you develop it since I then? did prior to coming to Schwartz Creek, okay. and I think it was very helpful. It allowed me to acclimate into the district, and it's something that I found very helpful. I've tweaked it, obviously, with, uh, based on specifics with Midland Public Schools, but I think it's crucial having this plan in place. It, sh it shows the superintendent as a strategic approach to entering the district and being successful, and I think it lends itself to being successful later. And this is the plan I put in place when I came to Sports Creek. And it's similar, and I tweaked it from there. I have a question. With going through the listening, learning all the way to efficiency with the operations and finance, do you think as you went through the process that you would tweak the vision? Uh, I know the vision within Midland Public School was something that uh, was done about three years ago. You know, I think there's always room to reevaluate where you're at within your vision mm -hmm. and making sure that it still matches up with the educational goals within your district. Um, you know, obviously the world's changing quickly. We're looking at 21st century learning. Technology is playing a larger piece. Uh, there's 
there's pieces within the vision statement that represent that. I think certainly going back through and analyzing, seeing where we're at, and seeing there's, if there's a need to do that, and if it's appropriate at this time. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Any more? We'll move on to John. <coughs> Dr. Hall, uh, describe the optimal relationship between the board and the superintendent. Discuss a time when you needed to advise a board that may have overstepped their policy main, ma making boundaries and infringed upon your role as an administrator. Specifically, how did you manage this? And uh, we do have three new board members that have come on board since uh, July of 2011. So we have had some changeover within the Torrance Creek Community Schools Board as well. Um, I think when you, kn you know you have an effective board when you're working for the same goals and vision, you're student-centered, I think it's great to have good discussion on how you get there and you, know, you, you gain the strength from getting diverse opinions and ideas. That's the strength of any organization is the diversity uh, within the organization, the opinions, but you're always working towards the common goal and you're able to vet those ideas out and reach agreement and move forward so that you're all paddling in the same direction. You all have the shared vision and that you're working towards that vision. I think that's when you know that you're an effective organization and an effective board. Uh, in regards to with uh, some of the things that we've done within Swartz Creek, we've had three, or we have four kind of senior board members within that. We've had mentors with our new board members that are working with some of the senior board members. In addition, we've had MASB uh, involved with facilitating some workshops on board governance. We also uh, did a book study uh, with uh, Tim Quinn's book on effective board governance teams, and we would report back out. We want to model what we'd like to see, obviously, within our <coughs> schools, and we're a learning organization. I think those are key that when you continue to uh, model what you want to see from uh, the leadership position as well. So those are some of the things that we have done within Sports Creek. Uh, I think working with the board president, uh, when you have uh, new board members that are still finding the, the role and understanding the, the piece, but obviously the end service through MESB is a great resource as well, mm -hmm. and just understanding um, all the intricacies with being a board member. And so you never had a situation where you had to take someone aside and and try to uh, remediate uh, <laughs> or think, gone uh, pretty smoothly? Or? Yeah, I, one of the things that came out of MESB is I, I think it needs to be done in conjunction with the board, either mentor or the board president. I think doing it directly with the superintendent uh, may not lend itself to peak governance teams. Those are things that, those are the board polices the board, is what MASB uh, shared. The board needs to police the board. Certainly, if there's issues within that and meeting with the board member and either the president or meeting uh, with the mentor, the person that's been assigned as a mentor and explaining some of that, uh, certainly works best. I think sometimes when you have, um, you know, we did have one situation where it was a personnel matter and there had been, been a history between a board member and a particular administrator uh, within the district and there was some, some previous history there that hadn't always been positive and making sure that we separated out the history from the current and making sure that that wasn't clouding judgment and that we were working in the same direction. So there was a situation that uh, we continue to work through with that. Thank you. If I called your board president, what would he tell me about how that's gone? Uh, Dr. Mitchell's a great board president. Um, he's, I think he w understands that, uh, you know, you, that as far as working with boards, you have people that come in and may not know all the, uh, the specifics of what it means to be a board member. That they, uh, they come on board with a, a thought that they function like a municipality or function in a different form. They don't function like a CEO and a board of directors, but they function more in day-to-day -day operations. And we've worked through some of, the, uh, some of those understandings with some of our board members. Uh, but I have a fantastic board president. Uh, he's been very supportive, and he's uh, definitely been supportive of myself as we've uh, worked through some of the challenging issues within the budget and within uh, student achievement as well. And actually, I think he wrote a letter of recommendation to that effect. Let's see. Next question goes to Kim. Uh, describe your experience with collective bargaining negotiations and what strategies can be used to promote collaborative relationships when bargaining difficult issues? Okay. That is obviously very challenging in the environment we're in. Uh, Midland Public has faced that obviously as well, the loss of 20J funding and also the cut in the foundation allowance and the, you know, losing nearly 2,000 students over the last 12 years. It's, it creates a perfect storm of issues financially. And certainly when you see labor costs being 88% of your budget, it becomes very challenging when, when you need to look at uh, alternative ways or concessions uh, to do that. So 
we are facing those challenges within Squirts Creek right now. We're still in the process of negotiating our contract um, within with our teachers union. We have been successful with our other union. I think you know we. I've been trained as far as with interest-based bargaining. I think there's a lot of pluses within that. You try to create uh, where you now have the, the win-lose um, feeling at the end of it, but you're all kind of work telling your stories, and it may take a little longer, but it may get you there. We'd had some uh, history within Sports Creek where we were not able to do that with this particular. I hold hopes out in the future that we may be able to get to that point, um, but we weren't able to do that in this particular round of negotiations uh, with our uh, labor leaders within the teachers union. We were successful with our other four uh, with our other four unions within the district in negotiating concessions. But I think obviously being as open and honest with all of the information you have, uh, the word transparency obviously is used uh, quite a bit and is on our websites as well. But I think as much information as you can convey, getting all of the information out there, explaining the story as far as what's taking place within you, all the factors that are driving that, and what's causing the need to look at the um, concessions or to look at the uh, labor contract and the way you're doing it. As much information you can supply, the better off. And the earlier that you can do that, the better off the tree. But it's obviously very challenging in the environment that we're in. Now, did administration take any pay cuts while you were doing this negotiation? I, yes, and actually, they've taken 5% cut. I came on board, and within three months, I had signed a contract, obviously, to start in July. By October, we knew where the budget was at. I was still under my existing beginning three-year contract. I said, we're going to start right here, and I took a 5% cut right from the beginning. I think you know it set the tone within that so that we weren't saying, well, this person hasn't done that, this person hasn't done that. That was the, the tone that was <coughs> set at the top and needs to be set at the top whenever you're doing that. But it still doesn't make it any easier, no matter what position you're in. But certainly when you set the tone, and leading by example, I think, is crucial, obviously, whenever you're a leader, um, setting the tone for what your expectations are for people that you work with. This is what I'm doing. This is why we're doing that um, helps make it more palatable. That's very good leadership. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Any other follow-up? Who, are you the lead negotiator in your district? Actually, our uh, HR that? manager is our lead negotiator. Our finance okay. director, HR manager, slash, is our lead negotiator. Um, we work closely. You know, we work with the board, obviously, on parameters on what we're looking for. And um, mm -hmm. we, obviously, I keep in close contact. We, you know, he calls me on a regular basis when they goes in, go into, uh, uh, times when they have breaks and in between. So I'm up to speed on all the information. But we do have other vehicles where we address it. We have what's called PEP uh, is another vehicle. It's not formal negotiations, but it's a problem-solving group. And I meet directly with the union leadership to address all of the other issues as well. And there are some crossover items, uh, not specific to negotiations, but items where we try to problem-solve about different things that may be taking place around the district and increase communication with our union leadership as well. So we do have that vehicle uh, that we work with. Any others? Jeff, I'm going to turn the first question I had back to this one. If I call the union president, what would they tell me about what we're going to do? <laughs> well, we're in a, let me um, explain Sports Creek Community School. Uh, if you Google us, um, you're going to find that uh, when tenure reform came about, there was a case that came out of Sports Creek. And my predecessor testified in Lansing regarding his challenges with the situation that was taking place with a teacher. So he testified down in Lansing with uh, Representative Scott, who was the chairperson of the Education Committee. And then subsequently, uh, when, my, when I came on board in July of 2011, the union president, as you recall, uh, Representative Scott has been recalled mm -hmm. to the education. Our union leadership helped to spearhead that because it's local down in Swartz Creek. And Swartz Creek's a bedroom community. Kind of, I grew up down in, in Carmen area, so I know Genesee County very well. And Swartz Creek's kind of a bedroom community for General Motors. And it was a real, um, it kind of evolved in the 50s and 60s and grew when the, and then there was a real increase within General Motors. So we're talking a very strong uh, blue collar base with uh, a long history of uh, deep union roots within Swartz Creek. So that is the, the community that, that's within Swartz Creek. So it's been, there's been uh, contentious relations within Swartz Creek between the administration and uh, the union leadership for a long time. And some of it was something I inherited when I came into it. It's been very challenging because those, the, those walls have been up before I ever walked through the door uh, with the tenure reform piece, with the subsequent recall of Representative Scott. Uh, so there's been a long um, history there where there's been some very, and it's very difficult to get some of those barriers <coughs> out. 
and we still have uh, staff members and, and uh, central office staff that was involved with those negotiations that was a part of that. So I think it's been very challenging to overcome that within the union leadership. We have pockets of, of fantastic things that are taking place within the district and very positive things that are taking place within the district. And it's not, uh, I don't want to mislead you to indicate that there's not very uh, positive things and great things taking place within that. But there's been, that's been a long-standing history within the district and it's very difficult to overcome those in a short period of time, especially when you have central office staff that's still there. It was a part of those negotiations and part of some of that history that took place uh, within that. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, Angela. Oh. All right. Tell us about one area in your district budget that you have had to trim or modify due to budget constraints, and how did you reach that decision, and who was involved in the decision-making process? A lot of them. Uh, we, when, uh, when I came to Swords Creek, we obviously I mentioned we had the structural deficit that came into play. So we started um, talking about what can be done, what are different areas that we can address, are there areas that we can consolidate services? Are there areas that we can do things to address some of the budget issues? Uh, at, at that point, we still had our own, our substitute teachers were still coming through um, the district, so we were paying retirement costs on all of our substitute. So we started looking at third-party options with our substitute teachers. We were paying a 25-cent retirement um, per dollar on the retirement piece. So we talked about that early on being an area. We were one of the last districts within Genesee County to do that. And what are some options? We worked with a, a company that was uh, able to allow us to do that for five cents compared to what we were paying at 25 cents on the dollar. So it was much cheaper, significantly cheaper to do that. We, this was something I learned closely with the board. We went through the whole budget analysis on where we were at with all the different line items and what were possibilities on things that we could address. And we started putting price tags in dollars and weighing out pros and cons of doing those. And that was one uh, that we saw that could be um, addressed and it would have minimal impact uh, for people. If we had people that were close to retirement <coughs> age, we tried to work situations out. If they were still getting a last few months in for their service piece and going to get them vested, we certainly would review them on an individual basis. But we moved our, uh, our substitute teaching process over to a third party contracting. We've had very minimal uh, issues within that and it's gone very well. So that was an area that uh, we addressed. We saved over $100,000. Obviously, that's a relatively small amount compared to your mm -hmm. 2.4 million you had to deal with. How did you do with the other? We have been work. Uh, we did the same thing with our custodials. We went to uh, uh, work with a third-party contractor as well. That saved us over a half million dollars. We eliminated an administrator, uh, saved us about another hundred thousand dollars. We had four percent uh, concessions from ASPE uh, as well. That saved us about seventy thousand dollars. We continue to negotiate with our teachers. We had a number of teachers uh, that were retired last year. Um, so we've been working through all of the um, different areas to get as many savings as possible. And how close are you to balanced? About 300,000 in deficit right now. We also sold off property. They heard there was, um, we sold $270,000 worth of property, uh, a place that they had considered for high school uh, a while back. And it was no longer under consideration to have a new high school. So we were able to sell that piece of property as well. So we're about three hundred thousand dollars in deficit right now. We anticipate will be right around a million dollars in fund equity going into uh, thirteen fourteen without a settled teacher contract. Should have gone from two years to three years. <laughs> yeah, but so. push, just keeps moving. Thank. Um, <clears throat> let's see. The next question would be Scott, I believe. Yes. Can you tell us how you set? fiscal priorities regarding the resources needed to educate children. And that needs to be our, you know, our, we have our vision, and really your budget is the manifestation of your vision. What do you need to do to accomplish that vision? And it needs to come back to student achievement um, and what we're going to do to maximize student achievement. You look at your different programs, initiatives that you have in place, you start talking about what are the resources that you're going to need to do that. If you can partner with your community, if there's creative ways that you can do that, you certainly want to do that. Um, but I think your budget represents a manifestation of your priorities, where you put your initiatives in place. And can you give me the second half of that question one more time, please? Uh, that was really essentially it, setting fiscal priorities regarding the resources necessary to educate children. I think it just goes back to making sure that you're student-centered, student-focused. That's what we're all about. That's <coughs> what we're here for. And focusing back in on, on that, uh, those things. I think also 
ways that you can be creative. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the cuts, but one thing that we put in place, we have a seat time waiver program, and I don't know if you're familiar with the seat time waiver, but it's kind of a non-traditional approach to education that's uh, taking place where you have kind of blended classes where students may come in, but they're not required to spend as many time, much time within uh, the seat. So within Genesee County, we have a homeschool population as well. We put a seat time program in place. We were able to, this past year, we have 40 full-time equivalencies that uh, we were able to capture. Most of those are homeschool students. So we have new FTEs that we've captured, and we're looking at over um, $270,000 that we anticipate that will generate this year. And we have expenses of probably about 130000 So not only looking at cutting, but there are ways that you can have programs that are appealing to different segments of your community that you may not have addressed in the past. I don't think you can just cut your way out of things. You have to be creative. You have to make sure that you're, you're meeting the needs of your community, marketing, thinking creatively, um, the same things that we're asking the, our graduates to do with 21st century skills are things that we want our superintendents to do as well, is find creative ways, collaborative ways to work with your community to make sure that you're maximizing resources as well. Any follow-ups? Uh, back to me. Um, can you give us a practical example of what 21st century learning that incorporates technology looks like okay. to what you've experienced? Yeah. We've done uh, quite a bit within Swartz Creek within technology. It's an area we're moving forward. We're wireless in all of our buildings, and we've been working through a variety of means, grants and other ways of securing devices as well. Uh, we're putting in place professional development. But when we're looking at uh, 21st century learning, you look at the broad outcomes, you look at the four seats. Communication, collaboration, creative thinking, cre creative creativity, and critical thinking. Those are your four C's that you really want to see as the broad-based outcomes with your 21st century learning. You have vehicles for getting there, and that includes you know global awareness. You have information, communication, and technology literacy, and supporting those. Using technology shouldn't be a standalone piece; it should be incorporated right into that skill set. And those are the outcomes so that you're incorporating the technology into that skill set and being successful within that. Uh, one area that we use a variety of ways that we're using technology, but the project-based learning, creating different projects that students can use as well. I don't know if you're familiar with Edmodo. It's similar to Blackboard. We've been using that in some classrooms as well, where they can post different programs or different projects that they've been working on. Uh, we use wiki spaces that share professional development information uh, as well within Squirts Creek. But utilizing technology, uh, we've Skyped in with professional development between classrooms, between buildings. Um, we have two buildings where all teachers have iPads this year, and they Skyped into each other. We're sharing apps through via Skype as one of the professional development pieces as well. Any follow-ups? Yeah, you mentioned securing devices. Um, are you doing, bring your own de your device? or? We're, we're in the process of looking at as well. We've uh, op loosened up some of our policy pieces uh, within NEOLA, and um, that's the Public. Have you gone to that now? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, so, yes, we've uh, loosened up some of our pieces where we can have students. It has to be student-directed. I'm sorry. It has to be teacher-directed as far as the, uh, the opportunity to bring the devices in and the utilization of these devices. So it's based on whether the teacher allows uh, the devices in. Usually it's for a specific area, but we have loosened that up in particular at the secondary level. We actually have it tiered between the high school, middle school, and elementary level on the availability of these of the devices, and we have some available for students as well that may not have their own devices so that uh, they're not left out of the equation as well. We have uh, instituted a flipped classroom for one of our uh, world language classes, which has been very successful, and he presented at the board um, a couple weeks back and recounting his success with uh, doing a flipped classroom for Spanish. And are you familiar with uh, flipped classrooms? Any follow-ups? Um, as far as the um, as far as the outcomes with the 21st century learning and using technology, um, what would you like to see as far as gains in efficiency and effectiveness, specifically? If there's many ways you can streamline your business services. Um, if you're talking about as far as within using technology within non-instructional ways, is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, I think any ways that you can look at using technology, whether it's your mapping your routes for your buses, making sure that you have the most efficient bus schedule information, you're purchasing so you're streamlining it. There's ways that you can uh, cut down um, 
human or uh, have less resources, human resources involved with that process so that you can streamline your, your services. I think that's crucial to, to be smarter and work smarter in that way and use technology to your advantage um, so that you can streamline and have less labor cost involved with that, and whether it's with transportation or whether it's with uh, generating the business in as well. So do you have a specific that you've done in your district of all those things you just We do. At? Actually, the, the busing piece has been okay. uh, very effective. We've used that, uh, saved us over $60,000, and we've maximized our, our routes. We have not had uh, issues regarding overcrowding uh, of buses. So, yeah, that's been very effective. Jeff, another follow-up then uh, that I have. Uh, as opposed to business services, how do you see technology enabling efficiency and efficacy in a classroom? Great question. Um, you know, we, now that you we have uh, devices, you can get immediate feedback. You can individualize learning. You know, if you take the money piece out, it's a very exciting time to be in education. Unfortunately, the money just went away. Um, we're able to do things that we wish we could have done when I started in this profession, and now we can. It's just uh, making sure that we uh, get the devices and have the infrastructure and the ability to do that. The immediate feedback, you know, the formative assessment, being able to uh, individualize learning. Uh, have exciting uh, feedback from the student immediately so they know how they're doing. They're not waiting till the next day to find out how they did for that math problem. They know immediately. It individualizes it. Um, you know, the, the big questions of what you want them to know, how do you know if they learned it and what are you going to do if they don't? Well, they have programs where they can guide that learning so if they have learned it, they go on to a more challenging area. Uh, it's a very exciting time to be in education and there's uh, lots of prescriptive education and learning that's taking place as the advances of technology come along. Thank you. Good. Are you using Google Apps for education, K through 12? Uh, yeah, we have Google, Google Docs we've been using for a variety of things. Uh, we do surveys with Google Docs. We're just in the process. You mentioned the, um, the vision statement. We're in the process of, uh, of um, reevaluating and uh, our enduring components, including our belief statement, mission statement, and vision statement. And one of the things that we did to those efforts, after we've gone through a committee process and some feedback, is we put a survey online and allowed anyone to be able to take the survey and we use Google Docs and it was a great tool to be able to get feedback and we could disaggregate the data in a variety of ways uh, to determine uh, what, which areas if the teachers were viewing this particular belief statement is not something or getting feedback on it so it was a great tool. Uh, we use it to share information, uh, we're using that as, uh, also with our professional development any, uh, any professional development that takes place, we're able to have the teachers have immediate feedback by using Google Docs. We also we share that if we have uh, particular items that we're working on. People can uh, log in and share the, the Google Docs as well. Are you using Gmail or are you on Outlook Express? We're still on, uh, we're part of GenNet within Genesee County. And so we have a countywide uh, for our uh, email and for a variety of other services that are countywide uh, through a millage that's supported through GenNet. Okay. Lynn? Mm -hmm. Describe your knowledge and any specific experience you may have <coughs> had in implementing and evaluating IB programs. Okay. Um, obviously, I was a uh, part of it when we had uh, when we have IB within Midland Public Schools. One thing that we looked at uh, when I was principal at Central, it became real clear early on that if Central was going to continue, we were going to have to have a niche program. We were going to have to have something that stood apart something that was going to be attractive to uh, the community. And so one of the things we started doing in, within a real small scale was looking at IB programs. And we uh, had a group of teachers and myself that attended uh, down in Columbus, Ohio, where we attended uh, IB training in Columbus, Ohio. In addition, we uh, attended training, or we uh, did visitations down in the Detroit area at several schools that offer the IB program uh, within. So we had some opportunity, we built some um, excitement over that obviously with that level and, and uh, looked at a variety of options uh, within the IB program. So that's something that I'm familiar with. We looked at it with the middle school years program. My understanding is it's moving forward in the primary years within Midland Public for next year as well, which is fantastic. Very impressed with it. We talked about 21st century learning. Uh, certainly that epitomizes uh, that with uh, some of the things that are taking place within the IB, the global awareness, the, the world language emphasis, the themes that are going about that. Um, some great programs around the state with IB. They have uh, the International Academy down in the Detroit area as well. It's another um, example of a fantastic uh, IB program. I think it offers uh, many of the, the skills that our students that we're looking for. Great. Follow up. If 
on. Share any experience you may have had in establishing equity for children with differing needs, implementing the response to intervention model, and developing and evaluating gifted and talented programs. Well, I um, was part of Midland Public Schools when we came forward with the uh, response to intervention model. And in 2005, I was <coughs> the, um, became the principal at Eastland Elementary School. And shortly thereafter, we started moving forward with a response to intervention model. That's where um, you know, we had the kind of the framework in place. It was kind of a philosophy approach where you're looking with a response to intervention piece. We're using data and you're benchmarking all students, seeing how they're doing, and then you're evaluating the data. You sit down in professional learning communities and problem solve. Hey, this is your data. What do we do with that? What are some strategies that we put, uh, we put in place? So it's kind of here in the infancy, infancy <coughs> within that. And one of the things that we talked about at the time with our staff at Eastlawn was having a more formalized structure, formalized professional development. That's when we sought out the My Blissey grant. And we were part of the original My Blissey grant with Longview at the time. I, think, I believe it was just Eastlawn and Longview the first year. And then we had other schools that added on thereafter. And that gave us kind of the, the uh, cookbook, if you will, for implementing uh, response to intervention model. And it had the PD that was available through the state of Michigan with great speakers, nationally renowned speakers. Um, so I think you know, looking at making sure that you're individualizing, that you're meeting the needs of your students, that you have quality professional development for, this teacher, for your teachers so they feel empowered, so they can reach the different needs within your students. When you have this data, understanding what you do with that data, what are your options with the data uh, now that you have this information, what do you do with it? And making sure you have a, uh, a wide range of, of interventions in place for that. As far as the other piece within the gifted and talented, I think it's on the other end of the spectrum, making sure that you have challenging program that you're extending out, uh, working. We've done some things with differentiated learning. Um, I think the name, uh, I'm, 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 I was part of the training that was involved with the uh, gifted and talented piece as well uh, within, the di within the district. Mrs. Weisick was a part of that as well and um, the differentiated piece on the other end. Again, you know, you're using data, and then you're having some extension activities involved. Uh, it could be um, furthering the different ways. We talked about project-based learning, and that offers an opportunity for students to shine in a variety of ways and expand and extend out for those students that are gifted and talented. Follow-up? Jeff, I called the staff over at Eastlawn. How did they tell me the implementation of RTI went? <laughs> Uh, well, I think for any change, it takes time to see your results. I think overall, it's pretty nice. I don't think anyone would go back. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we started it, and I think it was something that uh, we didn't have all the pieces ironed out at the time. It was kind of an approach. It was a philosophy to educating students, and we knew it was something that needed to be done. And whenever you're implementing any change, you're going to have struggles. But it was certainly something that we kept after. We knew it was the right thing to do. We just had to figure out exactly how we were going to get it done. Uh, we knew there were things that needed to be addressed. Uh, everyone, and that's when you talk about having everyone pulling in the same direction. We want to maximize student achievement. We want to make sure we're doing best by our students. Let's make sure we, and let's find a way to make it happen. And that's when we sought out the My Blissey project. Uh, okay, we know this is something we want to do. It's kind of overwhelming, putting together all these different pieces within it. We, you know, we need to have the, the, uh, the data piece, the, you know, the different tools for intervention, all the different pieces. Okay, how can we help pull this all together? Here's something the state of Michigan has offered. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Again, it goes back to partnering and seeking out resources to make it happen. And that's what we did in that particular situation, uh, was seeking out the resources and implementing using My Blissey to help us get to where we knew we needed to be. Thank you. As far as RTI and uh, what you did at Swartz Creek, um, did you implement that differently? And then my other question would be, Long term, do you see a role for that? Because um, it was an innovative model, fairly new at first, but the long term data supports keeping that intervention model? What was, uh, with Sports Creek, they were already in my Blissey district, and they were yeah. at the K 5 level and also at the middle school level, so they had those features in place. Really, they talked about some of the similar things a culture shift within the K 5, where we had teachers that were sitting down with data, it was lots of parallels. You know, listening to the teachers talk at Sports Creek at the elementary level were very similar to the discussions I would hear with the teachers within Midland Public Schools where they were talking about the shift and sitting down with data and using the data and taking it to, uh, to the next level. I think um, we talked about using technology. One thing, is that we're, one thing that we're seeing kind of the evolution of this 
is that uh, certainly the use of data is not going away, but the way you collect the data, you may be more effective and more efficient, and it may allow for quicker modifications in doing things. Mm -hmm. You may have some ways where you can have collect the data in a much more effective and efficient manner, but certainly the use of data and using data to help guide your instruction and uh, having many interventions in place <coughs> and many different tools within the toolbox, I think, is something that will continue, but you'll see that evolve as technology increases. Okay, thank you. Any others? I think it goes to you, Jim. Okay. Um, what experiences have you had in helping a school district uh, develop or modify program priorities? I think the priorities, you know, when we talk about your vision statement and talk about what you want to accomplish, that's what you need to focus back to. How does this fit in to our mission statement, our vision statement? How does this fit into our enduring component? component? How is this one of our belief statements? So whenever you have a new initiative, you have new things that are taking place, you need to talk about how does this fit into your existing enduring components? Is this going to help us move us in the right direction? And then prioritizing, we need to, you know, creating the why do we need to do this? What's the reasons behind this? What would take, why do we need to do this? And what do we can do this in lieu of? So when you're creating priorities, you talk about why this is the, the need to do that. And we're doing this, and this is what it's going to look like when we get there. So you talk about where you're at and where you want to be. Part of creating that vision and creating that shared vision and talking about why you want to go in that uh, direction. And we started doing that, I think, right from the beginning. We talked about some of the achievement challenges that I had within Sports Creek and creating that culture of teaching and learning and putting systems in place so that we are reviewing what we're doing and we're focusing on teaching and learning and our focus is on student-centered and maximizing our students and making sure, max, maximizing our student achievement and making sure that we have programs and systems in place that address that. I think you're, you're, as far as your priorities, making sure they fit back into your existing um, vision statement and mission statement. If I can follow up, but what specific program changes did you make? Okay. We, uh, we put some things in place in regards to at the secondary level with using data uh, to guide instruction. We started implementing different uh, assessment measure, measures. Staff meetings were no longer um, managerial in nature. They were spent on looking at student data, looking at data, Talking about interventions, the focus was back in on teaching and learning and student outcomes. So we put that in place immediately. Technology was an area that had been neglected, and we knew we needed to put some things in place, first and foremost with the infrastructure piece. So last summer we were able to put the wireless piece in place. We had technology planned. Uh, two buildings we were piloting where all teachers were going to receive uh, iPads for this year. And we've had uh, training that has been put in place, so maximizing the use of them. They've been attending different professional development. Uh, very excited. The feedback has been extremely positive. Uh, taking place. We had a board uh, meeting where we highlighted that recently. So it, it goes to a systems approach that we're putting in place, the implementation of more technology, and focusing in on using those tools to maximize student achievement and uh, fitting back into our, our mission, and mission and vision statement. Any others? OK, we'll move on. Uh, Kim. Uh, discuss your knowledge and any specific experiences in helping a district measure and report its own progress towards a strategic vision. Okay. <clears throat> well, we're in the process of doing that right now with uh, revising our enduring components, and that'll be our next step is now that we have our vision in place, developing action plans, and we've already started doing that. Obviously, we see technology as an area that we need to implement and integrate more in across the curriculum and putting the infrastructure in place last year. We're seeking out different grants. We're trying to be as creative as possible, put as many devices in our students' hands, and also making sure that we have professional development so that our teachers are able to maximize the use. So that's an area that we're continuing to focus in. And on. if you can give me just a second hand, one more time, please. Oh, well, what I wanted to ask you, the next phase of that is, um, do you provide any dashboard information for your Board of Education that they look at as far as class size and building capacity? Yeah, well, they have access to that on a regular basis, and we sit down with staffing. We've been pretty fortunate within uh, Sports Creek. We don't have a real uh, transient population, so our numbers are pretty stable. So we don't see big shifts within the school year. Mm -hmm. And as far as our class sizes, we present that information to our board members. As far as we're in the process of going through staffing right now, uh, seeing where we're at and determining where our needs are going to be and where we have retirements. So yes, that information is shared with our board members regarding uh, class sizes and uh, where we're at. We're, we're not in a position where we're at capacity within our buildings. I think we, uh, that district at one time was over 5,000 students. It's now 4,000 students. So that really is not an issue so much uh, within our district <coughs> as far as 
space. Uh, so there's always classroom space in the district. Jeff, a uh, follow-up to that. With that abundance of capacity, uh, what have you done to evaluate uh, the cost effectiveness of that capacity? Right now, we're uh, not in a position where we're looking at any consolidation of buildings. You know, with our seat time waiver co program coming in, we also have a flourishing, um, our child development center is going really well. The GSRP program has just exploded. We actually saw our kindergarten numbers go up significantly last year. So we, our enrollment is up 40 students, and we anticipate our enrollment may continue to increase in that range in the next few years uh, as well. We're seeing uh, more people, more uh, families moving in from uh, Carmen and from Flint to continue mm -hmm. to move uh, a little further out to the suburbs of Swartz Creek. And I think our, uh, we had some declining enrollment previously before I got there. I think we were 4,200 uh, three or four years ago. But we re really see that uh, leveling off, and we see more and more students coming into our area. In addition, I mentioned some of the innovative programs that we see will continue to grow and expand in regards to the seat time waiver. And uh, our test scores are increasing. We're seeing more students come in via school of choice. We're opening a $13.6 <coughs> million performing arts center, which is going to be fantastic. Uh, 650 seat. We're seeing students that uh, parents are coming in and say, saying, I want to see my child on that stage. There's school of choice in our district because of the performing arts center. And we're uh, putting some curricular pieces <coughs> in place to address that as well. And the performing arts center resource came from? This was actually very creative. This happened right before I came there. They uh, bonded the sinking fund. And they used ERA dollars to uh, get a very low cost loan. And they bonded futures. This came out of the, uh, the Recovery Act. And it was um, a piece within where they were able to bond at extremely low rate, future uh, sinking funds dollars. And so they bonded the sinking fund to get a $13.6 million uh, bond. So they didn't have to ask voter permission for that? Well, they did through the sinking fund. Yeah, but yeah, once they had the sinking fund, they just converted that Correct. to a bond and front end exactly. loaded it. Okay. Yes. And so they were able to uh, do that. And the reaction of the community was okay with that? <laughs> well, it's been mixed. Uh, you know, there was one other purchase out of the sinking fund was the cage. Uh, if you've had children, mm -hmm. and uh, we, Swartz Creek Community School owns the cage as well. And that was done in May of 2011 before I came on board for $2.5 million uh, as part of the sinking fund as well. And the refinance issue or re restructuring of the finance was done before your shift also? Correct. Okay. And that was done right before I came on board. And those are things that you, when I came on board, there's you know, still some healing there taking place within that. And there's some uh, feelings within segments of the community that have questioned that uh, decision uh, as well. And obviously listening, uh, the Performing Arts Center is, is going to be an amazing facility. And it is, uh, I think, Swartz Creek's the only uh, Class A school district in the state without a, a theater. So it was certainly something. And they had tried a variety of ways through different uh, millages over the years taking place back in the 80s. And you know, they tried to have a bond for the high school for the property that was mentioned uh, that was sold as well. So they tried to try a variety of different ways to address some of the, uh, the issues with it. And then obviously that puts a burden on you to figure out how you're going to maintain your facilities if right. the sinking fund is now in a creative center. We have $500,000 roughly a year for our buildings, and our buildings are old. You know, they're similar age to Midland Public Schools, so it really causes us to reprioritize um, looking roofs, boilers. Uh, wiring, you know, back to the uh, bare essentials on things we're looking at renovating. We have some very old. Mary Crapo is the oldest building. I think it was built in 1920. And that houses our CDC and our alternative ed. Obviously. And so your plan for is to squeak that out of operating budget? We, we continue to, uh, at this point, we're just using about $500,000 a year out of sinking fund. Okay. That we have left over after uh, the, those two buildings. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. I have a follow-up question. Sure. Um, have you created any other programs or initiatives to either capture students or curb declining enrollment? Yeah, well, I think uh, we, the seat time waiver was one program where we, we brought in 40 students, and we expect that to grow to 60 students next year. Um, and I think probably the, the best thing you can do is continue to be innovative and creative within that. The, and we're in a uh, kind of a different market in Genesee County. We have 21 districts. And we have a number of charter schools, so it's very competitive right. within the county uh, for school of choice. And families obviously have many more options than they used to. And I've said the best thing you can do is make your district the best district possible and as attractive as possible. And I think the Performing Arts Center will help with that. Having the theater, we anticipate that will be used on a preschool through 12th grade level. Uh, it will be the centerpiece of our community, uh, used for a variety of different functions. Increasing student achievement is crucial to maintaining your students and bringing more students in. 
that they see it and they rank them and they put them right in the paper as far as your MEEP scores for each of your grades, as far as uh, how you're ranking within your neighbors. And keeping your students is uh, obviously creating an attractive environment and uh, having achievement. We've been touting the fact that we've increased our math scores in every grade this year and that we've also uh, seen an increase in our AC tree and our MME scores uh, within all uh, areas last spring as well. So that we're, we're putting structures in place. We anticipate that will continue to increase and we think that will continue to drive enrollment up. And we've seen some of that with the increase from our CDC. Um, that's a program that's continued to expand through the Great Start Readiness Program, GSRP. And there's more money next year within uh, the governor's budget we anticipate within preschool as well. And we have a, a great leader there in Lynn Cabot and she's grown that program considerably. And what's nice is when you have, you bring students in, they tend to stay with you. And you see them growing and when you have them in preschool, they come into your system in kindergarten. And last year we had one of the largest kindergarten classes that we've had uh, in memory. Great. Thank you. And that cures your budget for a long time when they come in, in kindergarten <laughs> and stay with you. Angela. All right. Tell us about one initiative you are most proud of that you have implemented in your district. And what was the largest potential barrier to implementation? And how did you overcome that issue? Okay. Really, the, the ability, you know, I mentioned the, the technology piece. Um, we talked about creating a culture where we have a high expectations for our students. And creating, it, it goes back to the whole culture piece of what do we, what do we want for our students to be uh, when they graduate. What are the competencies that we want to see? So it goes back to having the high expectations for our students. What does that look like? And then once we, we have that in place, um, putting the systems in place, one of the things that I don't think our district saw was a need for wireless. That was something that I don't think there were too many people that, but I said, you know, this is something we need to put in place, is to build that infrastructure. If we're going to get to point, from point A to point B, we have to have the tools in our students' hands. First and foremost, we have to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place, and that includes going wireless. So obviously we were dealing with a very small, limited amount within our sinking fund, but this became a priority early on, and we used a lot of our sinking fund dollars last summer, 270000 to help us go to a wireless district. And it is revolutionizing the way that we uh, provide instruction to our students. I don't hear anyone saying we should be ripping it out. It's been very positive. But creating that sense of uh, what could be. And the, you know, the area within Genesee County is an area that's been beaten up, quite frankly, you know, because of what's taken place within General Motors and the community, the high unemployment rate, uh, you see a lot of areas within the community, property values are less than half of what they were before. Many foreclosures, it's a very economically depressed area. So you have to create the hope and the possibility and through education that our students can overcome and that they can go on to do great things. And you have to build that as a leader. I think it's important that you do that. You inspire others around you. You start talking about what that's going to look like and what you need to do to accomplish that. And within what I think we've accomplished within the two years <coughs> I've been there, is putting technology in the students' hands and getting it in the teachers' hands and creating the, the hopes and the dreams and seeing the possibility. That last staff meeting or last board meeting we had, where we had staff coming in talking about flipped classrooms, using different tools, Edmodo, the way they're using creatively uh, with different apps within the iPads and putting them in the students' hands, I think was very inspiring. It was started leading to more discussion about continuing on. So that's an area that I, I think will continue to grow and it was possible because we started putting the infrastructure in place within there. Even though there wasn't a lot of money, it needed to be a priority if we were going to uh, accomplish our vision. So do you have computer workstations for kids, or you talked about iPads for teachers? We, but yes, and within, um, more so within our K-5 piece, and we've uh, had a variety of pockets. We have, within our uh, title buildings, we have three per classroom. And within uh, some of our other buildings, we have pockets that have been purchased through a variety of means, through grants and other ways. And we're looking at span expanding that for next year as, as well, using different grants as well, so that we can put more. Uh, we're looking at Chromebook Chromebooks uh, at the secondary level and iPads more at the K-5 level. And we, uh, we anticipate that will continue to grow. And any more follow-ups? OK, we'll move on to Scott, I believe. All right. Two-part question. Can you tell us why you'd be a good fit for a MPS superintendent? And what do you think are the most pressing or significant issues facing Midland Public Schools? And how would you go about addressing them? Or how would you begin to address them? Okay. The fit and then the significant issues. Let me start with the significant issues. And then I'll tell you why I think I'd be a good fit. <coughs> um, I think the school community 
has been through quite a bit it's in regards to the um, many factors outside the control. Declining enrollment, the loss of 20J, the stroke of a pen, we saw the district forever change with its funding. Even going back to Proposal A, where funding was no longer locally controlled, uh, the, the cut in foundation allowance, all the things that have taken place within this district, I was here when a lot of it took place. And I think there's times when we need to bring the community back together, and bring the school community back together. It's time to mend some of those wounds and move forward. And I understand this community. Uh, we have many talented administrators and teachers within this district. This is a very supportive community. Uh, they, the first line within the mission statement stays in partnership with our community, and it certainly is. You see that at all levels. They've been very supportive, not only financially, but you see all kinds of service organizations, resources, volunteers that are coming into our school system. They have high expectations for their students, and they want to see great <coughs> things happen for our students. And I understand this community. I understand some of the issues that they've faced, many of them outside of their control. But I think now is the time to have a leader come in to be innovative, to move forward. We talked about those, uh, the four C's that we want to see with our students, the communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. I think I bring those skills as well. I think that's something that's needed within the next superintendent. Um, and I think I could help move us forward. Uh, it's time to turn the page into the next chapter. And I think I can do that. Follow-ups. Well, with that said, I won't go to the next question. So the next two, you've really answered a lot already, and the clock has is, is hit our end. So it's a great place to, to end. Um, but you have now 10 minutes to turn the, to turn the page on us <laughs> <laughs> and uh, ask questions to your heart's content. First, I want to say those questions lived up to my expectations. This is a great board, and <clears throat> obviously those were great questions and very challenging questions, and I appreciate that. I'd expect nothing less. So, um, Thank you so much uh, for that. I appreciate that. But if you, uh, a year from now, or a little more, longer than a year from now, what would you say, if you could answer individually, what would you want to see accomplished from your superintendent? You could name one thing that you would want the superintendent to accomplish 12 months from now. What would that be? Oh, accomplish within the first 12 months? First 12 months. What would you like to say, we want to see this established or this done within the first 12 months? I, I have. John? Um, to reinvigorate the vision of how uh, MPS can go forward into the next chapter of innovation and to um, um, build some unity in the community in that regard, but also how MPS is going to look uh, going forward and how that needs to look different, digital classroom and so forth. Others? I would say continue with our um, efforts toward technology implementation within the classroom and within the student body. Um, that needs to continue to move forward, and somebody's got to be on fire to <coughs> make that happen. And Scott, I would pile on your comment. I see two things, John's and successful implementation of our hopefully successful millages. Um, <coughs> that, that implementation phase has got to go well. and. Uh, the major part of that is what Scott just alluded to, but in addition to the sinking fund. And so the, if the voters show their confidence in us, we will need very good implementation execution yeah. right from day one, because it will be just about day one yes. when it happens. Hey. Go ahead, Kim. Oh, I'd just like to see the kids ready for 21st century jobs and higher percentage I was going to say, going to say um, looking at all our programs, is, is not just the technology, but as we talk about our IB and implementing the PYP and down the road the MYP and all those kinds of programs, Jeff, that, that the, the next superintendent will be excited about that part too and um, because our kids are well prepared, but programs change as we know very rapidly. Technology is one piece of that in the tool, but um, it's just a lot of as you discuss seat time waivers, there's just a lot of creativity in in, in instruction and curriculum. It really is. I think we're going to see more and more blended classrooms. Um, the traditional model we're seeing students, in particular at the secondary level, spending six hours a day in a traditional brick and mortar, the sage on the stage. I think those days may not be around in the same way. The, it, it, want to add one other thing I think is we'd like to see accomplished 
MPS is looking different as far as its free and reduced launch population. And we had a great presentation with Judge Allen and uh, the program that's involved at East Lawn because some of those are low tech right. uh, problems. Yes. Um, I would like to look at how we can have unique solutions to um, those challenges that MPS hasn't quite seen. Great. I think it's very important. That's that partnership with your community. It's a, it's a, it's a very unique community-based program, very innovative uh, with the, I think we tweaked it out of uh, Grand Rapids schools, or, or a school in Grand Rapids had done that. I was reading about it. I, I thought it's very exciting, very promising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to respond to Jeff's question? If not, we'll give it back to Jeff to throw another one. <laughs> okay. Uh, that <coughs> as far as, uh, obviously, with the budget pieces, and uh, that be continues to be a priority, um, where you anticipate you know, you're going to be looking, obviously you're in the process of doing, have you done a budget workshop yet? No, that's coming up next week. Okay, all right, so it's and it will, And it will create challenges. <laughs> yes. I, you know, the sneak previews, I, we know it's gonna create challenges. It may not be as dramatic as the challenge you walked into Schwartz Creek, but it won't be much less dramatic. Okay. <laughs> okay well, those are the, the big things. I just wanted to get your perspective on what you, you know, you're looking at for the next superintendent and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to interview. Um, it's a great school district, and um, appreciate the opportunity to come here and interview. Thank you so much. That's it. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. Jeff. Appreciate it Thank a bunch. You. Thank you. And we'll be back to you on Thursday. Thank you. What else did you have to say? And anyway, um, what, we, what we have to go to is through that process, keep an open mind through the process, make no preliminary decisions on candidates to hear all the candidates. Uh, lastly, and I implore you, especially with the events that have happened in some communities much like ours south of us, uh, do not go offline to interview. Uh, even asking questions or an innocent question is considered an interview if you go back to a candidate and ask them a question. Uh, all those interviews and questions have to be conducted in a public setting. So please uh, don't do that as we go forward so we stay out of that morass that uh, one of the similar to us is going through right now. So uh, that said, the agenda calls for adjournment, so we will adjourn. <laughs>